Okay, guys, today we are going to start with our next video, which is business model. Business models, right? So I think we'll be able to complete this reading today from the, uh, I mean, after completing this reading, I think maybe two readings are left with corporate finance. I think by the end of the next week, we'll be able to cover that as well. Okay, so what is a business model? So business model is basically, uh, it's like a plan. Um, and that plan is going to detail how the firm is going to make money, right? So it's like a plan that the company makes uh, to figure out how it's going to make money by selling things, right? So if I were to take an example, it's like uh, when you want to sell lemonade, uh, you have to think how much it costs to make that lemonade, how much you're going to sell it for, and how many people might buy it. Right. So a business model is just like that, but for a bigger company, they have to think who will buy their product or service, how much it will uh, cost to make the product, how much they can sell it for and how much margins will be they make, right? What would be the competition like? What would be the pricing strategy be like? Right. So this is your business model. It tells how firms are going to make money and we think it, uh, think of it as a blueprint for a successful business and see we are going to ask you know business model should answer a lot of questions right so questions like who are going to i mean how are we going to produce the product what will be the cost to manufacture the product who will supply the raw material do we need any special expertise to manufacture the product then we need to uh, think uh, of uh, who are who our customers are going to be right now our customers will be our customers depend upon what products we sell right so if we sell baby products our customers are going to be parents if we sell software for businesses our customers are going to be businesses and professionals right um, if we sell wigs then uh, our customers are going to be bald people right if we hear if we sell hearing aids then our customers are going to be people who have trouble listening to right so the your customers depend upon what product you sell right so if you sell air conditioners then your customers would be uh, in a place where you know there's a lot of uh, heat and all that stuff right so you're going to find less customers for air conditioners in hilly areas more more in cities and suburbs Right. Then we also need to think of uh, uh, why should our customer buy our product? What value proposition should we offer them? Right. Why should he choose our product over competitors? Right. So we should give him a strong reason to choose our product over competitors. I'm going to speak of this as well later on. Then we need to think of the customer acquisition costs. Now, what are these customer acquisition costs? Let's say a company spends uh, $10,000 on a marketing campaign in a month and acquires 100 new customers during that one month period, right? So to calculate uh, the customer acquisition cost, it's going to be uh, the total cost spent on marketing by the number of customers acquired. So that's going to be 10,000 by 100. How much is 10,000 by 100? I think it's 100. Let's say your customer acquisition costs are going to be $100, right? So you're paying $100 to acquire one new customer, right? So if the company's profit margins are really high, right? what is your profit margin? It's the difference between the selling price and the cost price. So if the company's profit margins are very high, then this $100 customer acquisition cost is going to look a bit reasonable. However, if margins are like really low, right? If margins are lower than the customer acquisition cost, then the company may need to have to reconsider its uh, marketing strategy, right? Then uh, we need to uh, we need to decide how how we price our product. Are we going to charge less than the You know, are we going to uh, charge less than uh, competition initially? And then as people get used to our product, we start increases uh, we start increasing prices. 
or are we going to differentiate our product on the basis of quality and features and charge a premium so the business model should be able to answer these questions right and then we need to decide that you know we need to make sure that are we going to make money at the price uh, we sell our product so will we be profitable at the price point at which we are trying to sell so that is you know is the price more than the cost if the price is not more than the cost naturally the company would be suffering losses and it would be burning cash and you know if you if you suffer losses then you tend to burn cash and then you need to raise external financing uh, to fund your uh, to fund futures future sales right then we need to answer is how are we going to sell our product right so what kind of a channel are we you going to use to sell our product are we going to sell directly to the customer or are we going to have some kind of an agent who's going to arrange the sale right are we going to use some broker or some agent or someone to uh, arrange the sale right right so these 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 are the elements of a business model this is the questions that the business model will try to answer now we talk of features of a business model right so first is that first question is who is going to be our customer so customer could be a b2b b2b or b2c or the government so b2b model is when one business sells to another business right that's a b2b business model right then you have a b2c business model where a business sells to a consumer and then you have business to government where the business sells to the government right so there's a b2b model b2c model and b2 government model right so government is a major buyer from private businesses right so the government often contracts with the defense and uh, aerospace companies to purchase military hardware such as you know planes missiles tanks and other uh, related equipment then uh, see the other features of a business model would be you know we should give our customers a reason to buy a product right so so we need to differentiate our product from from our uh, from our competitors right so we need to convince our customers as to how our product is different from the rest how is it better right how is our product better right so you know so if you offer a product that is as good as your competitors but you sell it at a lower price so you sell a good which is as good as your competitors but but you sell it for a cheaper price then you will attract a lot of customers because people love a good deal or you know you can what you can do is basically you can differentiate your product on the basis of uh, quality and features and you you can claim that uh, um, your product is the best quality that the customers can get that the market can get and um, your product is top of the line so you charge a premium you charge a premium here right so you charge a premium here so if if some customer wants the absolute best um, they'll have to pay a premium to buy a product right will they'll have to pay more than the market price to buy the product because your product is of premium quality better than the rest right or is your product offering some kind of an innovative solution right so if you come up with a new technology to solve some unique problem customers are suffering from um then that would give a strong reason for customers to buy your product so 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 first your customers could be your business model could be b2b b2c or b2 government and uh, your goods are only going to sell if you if you uh, give your customers some kind of a value proposition right if you give them a strong reason to buy your product and you can give them a strong reason to buy a product if you offer any innovative solution or if you if you give them a good deal by giving a similar quality as your competitors but at a lower price or you give them a very premium quality top of the line quality uh, but for that you charge a higher price right so if if someone wants the best of best quality top of the line quality 
then they are going to pay buy from you then how are we going to sell our product what's going to be your channel strategy right so how you sell your product is your channel strategy so are you going to sell directly or are you going to sell through uh, agents and all that so the first is your direct sales direct sales is uh, when the company sells to customers directly right so so let's let's discuss the traditional channel strategy first then you will uh, be able to understand the direct sales strategy what is the traditional sales strategy okay here the company or the manufacturer is going to sell to the wholesaler so wholesaler is someone who buys in bulk from the manufacturer then wholesaler sells to the retailer so there are few wholesalers and many retailers right retailers wholesalers buy in uh, bulk and then wholesaler sells to retailers retailers don't buy in bulk they buy in small quantities and then these retailers sell to consumers right so this is your traditional channel strategy and the idea is that once the manufacturer sells to the wholesaler wholesaler sells to the reseller uh, retailer ownership of the goods gets transferred right so once the manufacturer sells to the wholesaler then these uh, goods belong to the manufacturer uh, then these goods belong to the wholesaler right ownership of goods is getting transferred when goods are being sold when the wholesaler sends to uh, sells to the retailer now the ownership transfers from wholesaler to the retailer and once the retailer sells to the consumer the ownership gets transferred to the consumer that is but natural right so this is your traditional sales strategy cement sector and pharma sector still still uses the traditional sales strategy right pharma and cement they still use this traditional channel strategy now on the flip side you have direct sale direct sale is going to bypass the wholesaler and the retailer and uh, you know the manufacturer here is going to sell okay so the manufacturer here is going to bypass the wholesaler and the retailer and he is going to sell directly to the consumer right so this is your direct sale right guys any issues up till now anyone is having any issues i forgot to ask this guys anyone is having no. any issues okay so now this direct sale this involves the use of the company's own sales force so the company has to keep its own marketing team own sales people to make these direct sales so you know before e-commerce direct sales was very expensive for a manufacturer because they had to employ their own sales staff their own marketing team to make these sales but after e-commerce right uh, direct sales became very easy because you know e-commerce basically means when, when the manufacturer uh, sells through his own website right so after e-commerce when manufacturers started uh, selling through their own websites um, direct sales has become relatively cheap right it's become a very cost effective strategy for companies right so this is a very important point direct sales you bypass the wholesalers and you bypass the retailers you sell directly to the consumers before uh, before e-commerce direct sales was very expensive for manufacturers for companies because they had to employ their own sales staff their own marketing teams but after e-commerce what happened is that uh, manufacturers started selling their goods directly from their uh, website and uh, that became very cheap for them right um, they, they there was no need for uh, employing the sales team and the marketing team right and even if they had to employ them then you know a very few number of uh, people were required in the marketing team right in the sales team right? so after e-commerce direct sale has become very cheap then we have agents now 
manufacturer appoints brokers or agents and the job of these agents job of these brokers is to uh, look for customers and uh, look for customers who are going to buy the goods of the manufacturer and once they arrange the sale to the customer um, they get some commission they get some brokerage from the manufacturer right so these are agents so when you sell goods through agents there is no transfer of ownership right so the job of the agent is just to locate a suitable buyer for the products of the manufacturer and once if he gets the sale done he will get some commission he will get some brokerage right no ownership transfer in agents right agents uh, agents do not get uh, ownership of the goods right then we have drop shipping channel now in this uh, setup what happens is that the retailer does not uh, keep the products in his hand the, you know the retailer does not maintain a stock of goods so what what happens here is that once uh, the uh, retailer gets an order from some customer right uh, he is going to send the order and the shipping information to the dealer and the dealer would ship that product directly to the customer right so see a lot so what you do is that you get picks of goods from your dealer and then you have your uh, network of customers so you sell you send the pick of goods to to all your customers on whatsapp so your customers are going to if they if your customers like certain product they are going to order that then you are going to uh, send the product code to your dealer and the address of your customer and uh, to the dealer you are going to send the product code and the address of your customer to the dealer and uh, the dealer is going to ship that good directly to the customer right so so it's an it's 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 like what you know a lot of uh, people do these days if you have heard of an app called misho guys have you heard of this app called misho misho it's very famous in india so you know it sells all these salwar suits and sarees so what these these what this app does is that okay there are a lot of ladies um, you know housewife sitting idle at home so uh, what they do is that they register with misho misho is you know sends them the pics of a lot of salwar suits and a lot of sarees and what lot of a lot of indo westerns and then these uh, ladies have their own uh, uh, friend circle right they forward these uh, pics of these sarees salwar suit and all these indo westerns in these kurtis to their uh, friend circle if their friend circle likes that they they order that then what the housewife does is that it tells misho that okay they like this particular product they want to buy that you send that product directly to the customer directly to their friend so this is your drop shipping channel very famous these days right a lot of housewives do this days okay then you have your omni channel strategy now what is an omni channel strategy here both the digital and the physical channel are used to complete a sale right so what happens is that uh, you order an it uh, uh, item online and uh, pick it up from a store right so you order online and pick it up from a store so this is what people usually do so you, have you heard of ethos watches guys right? any idea of ethos watches this is a retailer of watches what you can do is you can order the item online at their website and what the what ethos is going to do is that they are going to uh, ship that uh, watch to some of their uh, branch to some of their uh, uh, retail outlet and you can collect that uh, watch from the retail outlet right so and because you know a lot of people prefer this because watches are very high end items right so they want to see the physical watch before they pay for it so you order it online then you they are going to ship it to the retail outlet in the retail outlet you visit the retail outlet check the watch everything is okay or not if everything is okay you pay for it and that's how the deal is completed that's an omni channel strategy guys are we good with this slide any doubts please yes or no is anyone having any doubts yes or no l1 l2 l3 
guys l1 l2 l3 all or some issues anyone uh, okay then uh, then you know for any business to be successful uh, they ought to have some key assets and suppliers right so businesses need to have expertise uh, to make products better than the rest right so they need to have a some kind of expertise right so need, they need to have management who's uh, who's been in that particular line of business for a very long period of time so they you know they have they'll have an experience as to how the business functions then you also need a uh, skilled employees these employees are going to make sure the skilled employees are going to make sure that the uh, goods manufactured are of high quality right and then you also you know at times you need uh, to employ skilled people to make sales right so those who know the product inside out and those who know the market inside out only those people can make good sales right so your sales team should be very very good so if you're not good with, if you do not know the product well if you are not thorough with the product you won't be able to sell it so you need skilled people to manufacture the best in best of the best quality goods call it best of the best quality goods and you also need a skilled uh, sales team to sell that good right okay then then patents so if you if we develop some technology and if we patent that the patent will ensure that no one else uses it so if a pharma company develops a certain drug and patents that drug then that patent is going to ensure that no one else can use that drug for a certain length of time and uh, during that time the pharma company is going to enjoy exclusivity of sales right so the patent is your key asset then you need software right to make uh, direct sales over the internet you need some kind of a good software right and uh, you need to ensure that uh, there is a st steady supply of raw materials because if the supply of raw materials is uh, not steady then that would result in disruptions in production right so i'll give you an example See, manufacturers of electronic vehicles, they require a steady supply of EV batteries, right? And EV batteries are made up of lithium and lithium is in short supply. So scarcity in supply of lithium could uh, create a scarcity in supply of EV batteries, which in turn would create issues for electronic car manufacturers, right? Electronic vehicle manufacturers, right? So if they don't get enough EV batteries, they won't be able to manufacture uh, they won't be able to manufacture electronic vehicles right so that that that's a supply side disruption and you know in such a scenario where, where there is a supply side disruption it makes sense for the company to acquire the supplier to take over the uh, supplier company so if if the manufacturer takes over the supplier company this in, this will ensure that there are supplies without any disruption right so so i'll give you an example here see all of us know what tata motors is it manufactures uh, commercial vehicles electronic vehicles and passenger vehicles commercial passenger and electronic right so the tata motors has recently uh, not recently now for a few years it has started manufacturing electronic vehicles right and you need ev batteries to run these electronic vehicles and these EV batteries are made out of lithium right so what now Tata Motors does is to to source this uh, uh, lithium based EV batteries what it what it has done is that you know Tata Chemicals which is basically a sister concern of Tata Motors right so all the Tata companies are owned by Tata Sons right that's the parent company and all these are there you can think of their uh, as their subsidiaries right so tata motors uh, gets its supply of ev batteries through tata chemicals right 
Tata Chemicals is a sister concern, right? So Tata Motors is never going to face any kind of shortages of uh, EV batteries, and it would be in a better position to manufacture electronic vehicles, right? So if if a boom comes in the electronic vehicle market, which is happening slowly and steadily, the biggest gainer is going to be Tata Motors because the uh, sourcing of EV batteries is in house, right? Tata Chemicals is going to supply to Tata Motors all these EV batteries, right? So, for this reason, I am very bullish on Tata Motors. Right? This is how we can understand business model to take make investment decisions, right? So, uh, business models are you know you should be very thorough with your business model because that would help you make more informed business decisions, right? Just like the example that I gave you. Yes, are we good here? Are we good? Yes or no? Okay, then there is this outsourcing. So outsourcing is that you don't manufacture yourself. You uh, outsource uh, the manufacturing of your uh, products to some third party, like what Apple does. Does the uh, does Apple manufacture all the iPhones uh, themselves? Guys, right? do they manufacture the phone themselves? Is there some factory in the US that is manufacturing these iPhones? Guys. Right? No. Is there, no, iPhones are manufactured either in China and they've recently started manufacturing iPhones in India. None of the production takes place in uh, US, right? So Apple does not have any factory where it manufactures it, right? So it, it, it's, it's outsourcing it, right? China and India are manufacturing uh, iPhones for the world, right? So, so these are the examples of key assets. Guys, are we good? Please, yes or no? Are all of us okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Then, you know, a business model should answer the following questions. Should we charge more, less or similar prices as our competitors? Right. Now, I don't have that slide, but based on pricing power, companies can be classified into price takers or price setters. Okay, now who are price takers? Price takers are people who sell commodity type products. So what are commodity like products? Each unit of a commodity is exactly like every other unit, like oranges, apples, tomatoes, potatoes, all that stuff, right? So no differentiation. So if you if you have a lot of sellers in the market and everyone is selling the same product say everyone is selling oranges no one can claim that their orange is better than the other right and there's going to be no differentiation there's going to be no unique selling point right and since there's going to be no unique selling point each seller has to sell at whatever price the market sets they can't charge more because if if one seller tries to charge more then the customer will switch to his competitor right the customer is going to switch to some other seller so price price takers are they have to accept whatever the market price is they can't set their own price and then you have your price setters price setters are basically you know these these would be companies that sell a differentiated product they fall into this category and they can command a premium for their products right so examples would be branded clothing like louis vuitton gucci and uh, luxury cars right or maybe some uh, watches rolex or omega all that or hublot whatever right so these they claim that their, their, you know, Louis Vuitton is going to claim that their handbag is superior to all the handbags made in the world. Yeah. Gucci is going to promise that their, uh, their shirt is much better than the rest. Mercedes or Audi, BMW, they are going to claim that their cars are going to be better than the rest. So is Rolex, Omega and Hublot and you know people pay a premium for this and they usually pay a premium for this because of the uh, snob appeal. That's it. Okay. 
so that is your and these people are price setters right they are going to charge a premium they are going to charge a premium because they are going to differentiate their products on the basis of quality so product differentiation when we talk of price setters think that these people are differentiating their products and they have been successfully able to differentiate their products and charge a premium for them right then guys there is something called pricing approach of a company now a pricing approach of a company can be value based or cost based now you know in value based the price of the good or service is based on its perceived value and not on the cost of the product or the prices charged by the competitor right so here you know this this value based strategy it tries to capture the maximum amount the customers are willing to pay for a product right so value based strategy is often used for pricing a luxury and premium quality products right so luxury products like uh, high end watches all these designer handbags these uh, luxury cars they use value based pricing because you know because customers are willing to pay a premium price for the perceived quality because of the exclusivity and the associated uh, you know the status associated with the brand right so that is your value based uh, pricing strategy where the seller tries to capture the maximum amount the customers are willing to pay for the product right and as i've already said this is applicable for luxury and premium quality products then we have cost based pricing where the price of the good is based on the cost plus a profit margin right so cost based is um cost of the good plus some profit margin but value based the seller tries to extract as much as he can from the customer right okay then you have this come let's come to this slide now um we need to understand uh, various pricing strategies that are based on price discrimination and what is price discrimination where different prices are are charged to different customers right price discrimination different prices are charged to different customers so first is tiered pricing now what is tiered pricing um uh, here different prices are charged to different customers on the basis of volume those who purchase in bulk get uh, discounts those who purchase in small quantities do not get discount right this is the usual practice right those who purchase a lot will get some discount those who buy in you know small quantities they don't get much discount that is called tiered pricing right then we have dynamic pricing dynamic pricing means uh, different prices are charged at different times so airlines hotels um you know they they are you know they they use a dynamic pricing strategy right airlines hotels charge more during the holiday season and less during the lean season then multiplexes also they also use a dynamic pricing approach right so morning shows in multiplexes are cheaper compared to movie shows in the afternoon or in the evening uber and ola all these uh, uber and ola is going to surge prices when it's raining because at that time rides are in high demand right so dynamic pricings are followed by the airline industry by the hotel industry and by this uh, by uber ola and all these guys right on by the multiplexes as well and then we have an auction we all know what auctions are and you know um auction depends upon how much customers are willing to pay for the product here bids are invited from customers and the item is ultimately sold to the customer who places the highest bid that is the auction right 
then you have uh, uh, pricing for multiple products first is bundling what is bundling bundling so here what happens is company sells two or more products together as a package and the price of the package is less than the combined prices of uh, the individual products right so an example is going to be a uh, what do you get in mcdonald's meal what do you call that meal happy meal huh? yes so happy meal is an example of bundling right so mcdonald's offers this uh, happy meal it includes a burger fries and a cold drink and uh, the price of this happy meal is going to be less than the combined price of the burger fries and the drink right the value of the meal is less than uh, if each item was purchased separately right it's going to cost less to buy the meal uh, compared if compared to if we were to buy each item individually right and this bundling is going to encourage customers to buy more than they could more than they would if uh, each item were sold separately right they end up buying more why buy bundling right because they think okay i get uh, if i were to buy these three things individually it's going to cost me 200 but i get this uh, happy meal at 150 so might as well buy this happy meal but their initial budget was only 100 right so they end up buying more they they had ended the mcdonald uh, uh, store thinking that they will only spend 100 rupees but they end up spending 150 and that's because of bundling Okay, then is razor and blade strategy. Razor and blade strategy is basically where the company sells the main product at a lower price and makes a profit on the sale of complementary goods, right? So this, you know, this, this strategy is named after the business model used by the razor industry, where the razor are sold at a razors are sold at a very low price, but uh, uh, you know, so razors are sold at a low price, they are even sold at a loss. But the blades, all these razor blades, the profits are made on the sale of these blades, right? So they charge a very low price for the main product, but they make a profit on the complementary products. So they'll charge very low for the razor and uh, they'll make a profit on the sale of blades. This is also happens in the printer market, right? So Computer printer is a great example of this. Computer printer is sold at a very low price, but the ink and the cartridge is very expensive, right? So now HP sells printers at 2700, 2800. You get printers at 2800, 2900 online at Amazon. But when you when your ink gets finished and you try to buy a new cartridge, the color and the uh, black ink cartridge comes at 1600, right? And this cartridge, you know, ink is going to get over in a few days and then you have to spend another 1600, another 1600, right? So they charge very exorbitant prices for the ink, but the printer is uh, very, very cheap. So they make, razor and blade is you don't make profit on the main product, but you charge an exorbitant price for the complementary product. You don't charge much for the printer, but you charge a whooping amount for the ink and the cartridge. That's your razor and blade strategy. And then you have the optional product pricing strategy. Now, what is this optional products pricing strategy? So, see, if you buy the basic model of a car from a factory floor, it's not going to be that expensive, right? But once you buy it, then at the dealership, uh, some uh, salesman is going to tell you, okay, sir, we have this. Uh, you can add a number of add-ons, right? We have these accessories, we have these alloy wheels, we have these mud flaps and all. And, uh, you know, we, we, we get you these foot mats and these seat covers. And if you use, if you, you know, if you choose to add those uh, accessories, then uh, the product is going to become really, it's going to become ex expensive, right? So the base model of the car is not so expensive. I mean, uh, you know, base model is going, is not so expensive, but if you add these add-ons, it's going to get more. 
expensive right that's your optional product pricing strategies right so if you stick to the basic model the price would be a lot lower but if you buy these add on accessories costs are likely to shoot up right and then you have these uh, pricing for rapid growth first is penetration pricing so what is this penetration pricing where the company offers a new product or service at a lower price than its competitors to quickly gain market share and once customers get used to the product uh, then the company starts to increase the price like this is what jio did reliance jio this is what they did in india right initially they distributed sims for free maybe you know uh, using the sim for a certain number of months was also free but after a period of time they charged uh, they started charging some money right that is penetration price penetration pricing you don't charge initially but once customers used to uh, once the customers get gets used to your service you start uh, hiking your price you start increasing your price um then you you have something called freemium pricing what is freemium pricing where the basic product is free but add on cost money so think of spotify spotify uses freemium pricing so spotify offers a free version of its service uh, that uh, allows users to listen to music with occasional ads but also offers a premium version that removes ads allows for unlimited skips and offers higher quality audio right so this premium version is payable but the free version does not require you to pay anything as the name suggests but the premium version which is going to allow you to skip ads and uh, uh, allow for unlimited skips and offers more for higher quality audio that's going to be chargeable that's premium pay that is premium pricing where the basic is free but add ons cost some money so spotify basic is free but the premium version is chargeable the premium version removes it's going to remove ads this is also applicable in youtube right so youtube also there's uh, this uh, premium version where uh, you don't where which removes ads right there's this premium uh, what do you call that youtube uh, what is that service called premium service offered by youtube which allows you to remove ads YouTube premium. To, yes, that's YouTube premium. Yeah, it allows you to skip ads. So that is your premium pricing. YouTube is going to charge some money for YouTube premium. So that is premium pricing. And then there is this hidden business revenue model. Now, what is this hidden business revenue model? Now, services offered by the business are free, but uh, revenue is generated from other services such as advertising. Right. Now, think of Disney Hotstar. Disney Hotstar is showing the Cricket World Cup for free. Is it charging anything from us? Even if you don't subscribe to Disney Hotstar, you can watch uh, the World Cup for free. So how is Disney making money on here? How is Hotstar making money here? By the advertisements, right? So whatever advertisements you see uh, while watching the match, those advertising are a source for revenue for. Disney Hotstar. So that's a hidden business revenue model. Basic service is free, right? Uh, the the uh, services offered by the business are free, but revenue is generated from other services like advertising, right? So that's your hidden revenue business model. Guys, are we thorough with this slide? Any issues here, please? Yes or no? Guys, are we thorough with this? Yes or no? please should i move forward are there any doubts please no sir okay then we have uh, you know there are alternates to selling the product outright right so here we were selling the product outright here the seller was selling the product outright but there are alternates to that and those alternates are leasing subscription models fractional ownership models licensing franchise right so these are alternates here the ownership 
it is not transferred to the uh, customer right the ownership of the goods is not transferred to the customer and it's alternate way of generating revenue for a company right so first is leasing right so rather than leasing the product to the customer rather than selling the product to the customer we can lease it right and uh, the manufacturer retains the ownership of the pr product uh, here right so you don't sell it you lease it so once you lease it to your customer the seller still retains uh, the ownership right and after the lease period expires the customer can return the product to the seller right so a lot of hotels are now operating in this leasing way right what happens is that the original owner of the hotel leases it to some third party for a monthly rent right now once the original owner releases it to the third party then the original owner is still the owner of the hotel he's just leased it to the third party right and the third party is going to pay a monthly rent to the original owner right so third party is going to use that hotel he's going to run the hotel right whatever profits of the hotel are that's those profits are going to go to this third party whatever the profits that the hotel generates during the lease period is going to go to this third party and out out of these profits the third party is going to pay rent to the original owner right so this is how leasing works but here the original owner retains the ownership right even if he leases the hotel to the third party the uh, ownership title is not transferred to the third party the or the original owner is still the owner right that is your leasing then your subscription models so some companies charge a monthly subscription uh, from their uh, customers to use their services right so netflix prime video disney hotstar they charge a annual fee from their customers but ownership is not transferred right now if you subscribe to netflix you you not the owner of netflix right you just get a right to use uh, net netflix uh, for a certain period of days right then you have fractional ownership right so what is fractional ownership fractional ownership is uh, you know it's a type of an ownership uh, model where multiple individuals or entities jointly own a high value asset right a high value asset could be a property a luxury item or a business right and each each owner typically owns a fraction of the asset and the ownership is divided into shares or units right so let me give you an example right so think of this right there's a group of people who buy a vacation home right they buy it together and divide the ownership into shares and each owner you know so a group of people are buying a vacation home and each owner uh, has the right to use the property for a certain number of days in the year right and cost of the maintaining that property are shared among the owners right so this this allows each owner to enjoy the benefits of owning a vacation home without having to bear the full cost and responsibility of ownership right so that's your fractional ownership then is licensing licensing is when you uh, sell the production and the selling rights of your product to a third party for some fee right so rather than the hassle of producing a product all by yourself you know, rather than the hassle of producing and selling it all by yourself what you do is that you sell the license to um, to some third party right so that's your licensing right so i'm going to give you an example here nestle and uh, starbucks they had entered into a licensing deal sometime in 2018 and what was the deal well uh, nestle got the exclusive right to sell starbucks products all over the world like coffee tea and coffee beans right and uh, nestle used its uh, huge network of stores and distribution channels right and uh, nestle had to pay some 1.75 billion dollars 
billion dollars to Starbucks for this right to market its product globally, right? So this this was a licensing deal, and see this deal was good for both companies. See, Starbucks got to make uh, its brand famous around the world thanks to Nestle's uh, distribution network. And uh, Nestle got access to Starbucks products and uh, Starbucks strong brand name, which helped them make even more make even more money, right? So Nestle bought the license, uh, bought the right to use the uh, right to sell and uh, market the products of Starbucks globally, right? So that was the licensing deal between uh, Nestle and Starbucks, and it cost some 1.7 billion, 1.75 billion dollars to Nestle. right and then is franchising franchising is very is similar to like licensing only here the franchisor will give the franchisee the right to sell or distribute its product or services in a specified territory right and uh, the franchisee receive uh, marketing and product support from the franchisor and in turn the franchisee is going to pay a percentage of revenue to the franchisor so think of mcdonalds right mcdonald's uh, parent company is the franchisor and um, you go to mcdonald's and you tell that okay i want to become your franchisee i want to open a mcdonald's store right you want to open a mcdonald's store so okay uh, the parent mcdonald is going to tell you that okay you buy land you make the property you construct the property right and i am going to tell you how will you make that property in what area should you buy the land and then i am going to give you uh, support as to how to um, make these burgers these fries and uh, all that stuff that mcdonald sells i am going to give you support and i am going to train the staff as well right and for all these services the for all these services you have to pay me some portion of revenue right so so this is your franchising agreement guys are we good with this so in all these cases what is happening is that the ownership is not getting transferred right so when you sell the product the ownership gets transferred but in these cases while leasing while subscription you know in subscription models in licensing and in franchising the ownership of the good is not going to get transferred right so when nestle entered into a deal with starbucks and paid uh, 1.75 billion dollars for that licensing deal uh, it just got the right to uh, sell the products of starbucks it did not own starbucks right so here if this is an alternative to owning are we good with this guys any doubts please yes or no should i move forward guys all good yes no yes l1 l2 l3 okay then is some other business models that i'm going to discuss let me see if there are any issues guys all l3 okay then we have other business models first is your private label manufacturer right uh what is a private label manufacturer so here the what the company is going to do is it's going to outsource the manufacturing of the product to a third party the third party is going to manufacture goods for the company and it's going to print the tag of the company or uh, it's going to print the tag uh, of the company on the good and ship it back to the company right so at what times what happens is that a lot of clothing stores right they don't manufacture themselves but what they do is that they outsource the production to some third party and the third party is going to make the uh, shirts and uh, jeans and pants for the for the for that for the company and they are going to label label their tag on that uh, label their tag on that product right okay so let me give you an example say uh 
my brand is say uh, my brand of product is say xyz right this is my brand name and i don't want uh, i don't manufacture myself so i find some outsourcer i outsource the production to some third party right and the third party is going to make clothes for me right and on these clothes it's going to print my brand not his brand so third party's brand is not going to appear on these clothes my brand this xyz brand that i own those would be printed on these clothes right those you know tags labeled as xyz would be uh, printed on these clothes right so that is a private label manufacturer right other example is the guys you know dmart dmart is a retailer in india sells everything it's also a private label manufacturer right so what it does is that you know it's dmart sells a lot of indian snacks right and uh, those indian snacks are sold under the brand dmart but dmart does not manufacture these snacks on its own right dmart uh, outsources the production of these snacks and uh, you know dmart specifies uh, uh, these private labels so these uh, these people whom you know these people to whom these uh, uh, no, to to whom the production is outsourced they are known as private label manufacturers right? the people to whom these uh, production is outsourced are known as private label manufacturers so what dmart does is that it's going to tell these private label manufacturers um, what specifications it wants what kind of snacks it wants how to package those snacks and all that and these private label manufacturers are going to abide by the specifications set forth by set forth by uh, dmart and they're going to make the snack packet it but they're not going to put their own name on that snack they're going to put dmart's name right so that is your private label manufacturer then you have your licensing agreements that we just spoke of right um uh, and then you have this value added reseller right so then what this value added reseller is that it you know this reseller purchases a basic product from the manufacturer and then adds value to those products by providing additional services or customization before selling it to their customers right so i buy the buy a basic product from the manufacturer and i add some uh, value to it right and uh, i how do i add value by adding more services or i customize that product and then i sell it to my customers that is a value added reseller right so what is can you give me an example of a value added reseller guys guys can you give me an example so guys uh, think of this say i buy a basic computer from a manufacturer and to that basic computer i add additional software or hardware that is i add additional memory or i add graphic cards to that computer and after adding that uh, after adding that additional memory after adding that uh, graphic cards i sell it to my customer that is a value added reseller right okay then some other terms guys what is affiliate marketing guys what is affiliate affiliate marketing any idea what affiliate marketing is see all these fashion bloggers they try to sell products of uh, different brands uh, through their uh, uh, youtube Commission videos through the yes, through their fashion blogs that is affiliate marketing right where a product is sold by sharing it on a blog or some social media platform or some website right so uh it's common in bodybuilding and uh, you know fitness enthusiasts to monetize uh, their uh, online influence and social media following through these affiliate marketing right uh, 
so see there are going to be very there are lot of body body building influencers and uh, fitness influencers now these these fitness influencers they partner with companies that sell supplements or workout gear and other fitness related products to promote their products to their followers right so in their videos in the video of the fitness uh, in fitness influencer they are going to tell you that how a product of a particular company help them uh, in their bodybuilding journey right and it's going to tell them all it's be you know the fitness influencer is going to say very very good things about that particular product he's going to say that it added to my muscles i could punch a wall after having these supplements and all that and all the followers of the fitness influencers are going to get uh, you know they're going to be enticed to buy that product right and whosoever uh, buys that product um, and and these fitness influencers are going to say that okay if you buy this product using my product using my discount coupon then uh, you're going to get an additional discount right so or you know the fitness influencer is going to give them a link uh, which will direct them to uh, the website and uh, through that website they are going to buy the product so whosoever buys that product using the link using the link provided by the fitness influencer you know uh, the company is going to pay commission to the fitness influencer for that right for that sale so whosoever uses that link which was told by the fitness influencer so if that link is converted into a sale the fitness influencer gets some commission and uh, you know these food bloggers also do this they often partner with food and kitchen equipment brands to promote their products to their followers so they're going to share uh, recipes write reviews or recommendations and all that right so nestle was doing this right in in if you watch uh, that show master chef so it was saying that if you make this kheer with milk maid this milk maid is going to taste very nice and all that right so that is all that is affiliate marketing right and see travel influencers also use a lot of affiliate marketing so so through their uh, you know they they up, these travel influencers they upload their uh, travel journeys on youtube right and uh, they, they they you know they going to partner with the uh, hotels airlines and tour companies to promote their products to their followers right so wherever they travel they may put up at a hotel and the hotel and the uh, travel influencer are going to have an uh, you know some kind of an arrangement amongst themselves right so the travel influencer is going to promote the hotel in his uh, blog or in his youtube video and so you get the idea right so that is affiliate marketing where you use some uh, blogger or a fitness enthusiast or a fitness influencer or a fashion blogger or a uh, you know or a, or a travel uh, influencer all that to market your products then you have your marketplace business what is a marketplace business so marketplace business it provides a platform for buyers and sellers to come together amazon yes amazon ebay all these are marketplace businesses platform for buyers and sellers to come together right so all flipkart amazon all these are marketplace businesses right and then you have aggregators so aggregators uh, also provide a platform to buy and sell goods but what's the difference so your aggregator is an uber or an ola but what's the difference between an aggregator and a marketplace business both provide a pa- platform for buying and selling but what's the difference between marketplace business and aggregator see the aggregator is going to sell the goods under his brand name right so uber ola bring a lot of uh, you know so the ride that you are going to take on uh, uber or ola uh, you know uber ola is going to sell that ride on their own brand name right but on marketplace business what happens is that you know ebay 
and Amazon, they don't sell on their brand name, right? Uh, so they quote whosoever is selling that product, right? Who's who, who? You know, if you go and buy the product, you you can see who's offering that product, right? And Amazon, can you see that who's offering the product, right? So if you go, uh, if you go to buy on Amazon, you can uh, T-shirt. You know, it's going to say that it's a US polo or it's going to be a Tommy or it's a Ralph Lauren. I think Ralph Lauren is not listed, but uh, Amazon is going to tell you which brand that T-shirt belongs to. But Uber Ola is not going to tell you. Uh, uh, you know the whose uh, whose uh, car you are going to ride on, right? Who owns the car that you are going to ride on, right? Does Uber and Ola tell you? Will Uber tell you who owns the car you ride on, right? Does Uber Ola tell you? Does Uber tell you whose ride you are going to? Who owns that car in which you are going to travel? No, it does not, right? So Uber and Ola sell. Uh, sell their products or services on their own brand name but amazon they just provide a platform for buyers and sellers to come together and the sellers are going to sell the goods on their own brand sell uh, you know the sellers are going to um, sell using their own brand right then you have something called network effects what are network effects guys are we good with the difference between uh, uh, marketplace business and uh, Aggregators, are we? Do we have any issues here? Yes. Do we have any issues? Please tell me. No. No, sir. All good. All L threes, or any L one, any L two. Please tell me in the chat box. I'm going to complete this reading today. Okay, then you have something called network effect effects. Now, what are these network effects? You know, you know, network effect means uh, basically where the value of the uh, company increases as the number of subscribers increase. Value of the company increases as the number of subscribers increase. Right. So Uber and Ola are going to provide greater convenience, greater reliability when uh, more drivers join their platforms, right? They are going to provide you, you are the users of Uber Ola. So they are going to provide you with more convenience and more reliability if more drivers get registered with Uber Ola, right? eBay, Amazon, Alibaba, they also offer more value. They are going to offer more value to its uh, users if 1 million uh, sellers are associated with it uh, if 1 million users uh, sellers are associated with them rather than a 100 or a 200 right so they are going to provide more choices and uh, more options to its uh, users if if more sellers are registered with them right um, swiggy zomato they are going to provide more value to its customers if more restaurants are registered with their platforms, right? If more restaurants join their platform, right? So here the value of uh, the business increases as more sellers get uh, registered with the platform, as more uh, subscribers get registered with the platform, right? So if a lot of res restaurants get associated with the uh, Zomato, then um, the users of Zomato are going to get more options, right? And that's going to increase the value of Zomato, right? If if more people get registered with the, uh, if more uh, drivers get associated with Uber, then uh, riders will have more options and they'll have greater availability, right? You will be able to get uh, taxis much sooner there, right? If more drivers are associated with Uber. That is your network effects, where the value of the business increases, as the subscribers increase and then is crowdsourcing um, so what is crowdsourcing where we use our customers feedback to increase the value of our product where we use our customers feedback right so give, can you give me a website that offers crowdsourcing where customers feedback increases the value of a product 
have you gone through a website called tripadvisor guys are you aware of tripadvisor it's a very popular website guys tripadvisor is anybody aware of so if you go to tripadvisor it's a travel website that relies on crowd sources crowd sourced reviews and ratings from uh, travelers to provide information and recommendations about hotels restaurants and activities so if you go to tripadvisor's website so let's go to their website let's go to tripadvisor's website Trip. So, just night a name of a hotel, right? So, I went to Masuri a few months back. So, I stayed put up at this hotel, right, from the Brentwood, Masuri. Now, I found the reviews of this, you know, before deciding whether I need, whether I got to, I should visit this hotel. Um... I got the reviews from here, right? So you get a lot of reviews, how the things are and what. So where are the reviews? Let me scroll down. You get the pics and all, right? So so there are people who are reviewing it. So you can see the reviews, great experience, courteous staff, wonderful experience, all that. So you can look at these reviews and then you can uh, book your room in the hotel right and uh, see if, if you get a lot of good reviews then uh, more people would be inclined to book the hotel right but if there are a lot of bad reviews then you're going to ignore the hotel so we, this trip advisor is basically crowdsourcing where we use our product you know customers feedback to increase the value of our product right so this is an example uh, of crowdsourcing Right. Guys, are we good with this? Any idea? Uh, any issues? Guys, anybody having any issues? Yes. All good. This reading is over. Nothing. Okay, one thing is left. But uh, that is value chain analysis. I'll discuss it on Tuesday. And uh, then uh, we'll start the next topic.